Well, good evening, and welcome to our very special evening that we have planned tonight. Thank you for coming. Um, before we begin, we'll sing a song, but let's turn our gaze to the true focus of the evening, which is the Lord, the faithful God who has uh, overseen and overruled all of this and continues to do so. So hear these words from uh, Psalm 86. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord, my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. Let's stand and sing and praise the Lord together. may be seated. <clears throat> well, good evening. My name is Eric Snyder. I serve here as an elder, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this special e evening service. We are so glad that you have joined us to celebrate Alistair's and Susan's 40 years of gospel ministry at Parkside. The elders believe this is a milestone worth marking. It helps each of us remember God's faithfulness to us in the past, and it encourages us to trust in God 
for all that the future holds. So as we begin, would you please pray with me? Almighty God and everlasting Father, we bless and praise your name for you alone are worthy of all our praise. You are the giver of every good and perfect gift and we thank you for the gift of Alistair and Susan. Your word tells us that you arrange the members in the body, each one of them as you choose. Thank you for the roles that you have given Alistair and Susan to play in building up the body of Christ here at Parkside. May all that we do and say in the moments that follow bring praise, glory, and honor to you. We ask this in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Amen. I'd like to invite Alistair and Susan and Pastor Jonathan Cameron up to the stage for some time of Q&A and some special video presentations. Ooh, scary up here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, should, you should know that <clears throat> this is not the most uncomfortable I've been sitting with uh, Alistair and Sue. Uh, when, when Megan and I were first married, we had an elder pastor dinner and uh, Alistair sat between us for the entire time. Um, he made me move and he asked questions the entire time. So I, I did. Yeah. <laughs> so now you're getting your own back. <laughs> Maybe, maybe so. Well, we just wanted to spend a, a little bit of time tonight uh, thinking back over, over the years. And if it's an encouragement to you and settling in some good ways, uh, we recognize that in every way that we are grateful for each other and for the family that God puts us in, ultimately, uh, it fixes our eyes even more on Christ. Amen. Uh, so I hope that that's an encouragement to you. I'd, I'd like to go back if it's okay, because if we're thinking about 40 years, really we have to go a little farther back than that. Um, and it, that gets us closer to 50 than it does to 40. So if, if we go back, uh, Alistair, I'd like to start with you if that's okay. Uh, 1975, London, England, okay? Mm -hmm. um, Harold Wilson is prime minister at that point. Uh, the Bay City Rollers and Rod Stewart are number one on the charts. Good? It was a great year. Yeah. Uh, a, a sprightly Alistair Begg has just graduated from London Bible College. Uh, if we could talk to you then, uh, who were you listening to and what did you imagine the future held? What did, what did you want to do at that point in life? Well, post, post LBC? Yes. Yeah. Well, um, I, what, what I, if you'd asked me in 1973, I said, well, I would like to serve God, but I definitely don't want to be a pastor, um, because I'd had a lot of those men in my house, yeah. and they were scary. And, uh, <laughs> and they would say things like, maybe one day you'll be a pastor, Sonny. <laughs> and, uh, scared the bejabbers out of me. I run through to my mother. But anyway, um, by 75, by graduation, I had an appointment in, in Philadelphia on the 16th of August to get married. And fortunately, Derek Prime had offered me the chance to become his assistant. Otherwise, I would have, I don't know what I would have done, because I don't think your father would have gone through with the project if, uh, if I'd shown up with no job. So... Who was I listening to? Everybody that I keep talking about all the time. Um, if you mean listening to for instruction and edification uh, to all the people that we talk about. Uh, Lloyd-Jones, um, who was by then just a traveling show. Not a show, but anyway. Um, and I had met Dick Lucas in 72, and so he was a huge influence, as was all the other guys. Yeah. Good. Uh, 
how was it that you ended up getting paired with Charlotte Chapel? How did that partnership, how was that arranged? It was a fascinating story, really, because, in fact, I just had a text yesterday from the gentleman that I followed as the assistant to Derek. And I wrote to him this afternoon saying that I was not particularly looking forward to this. And I said that I remember going to his home and um, meeting with he and his wife. They had me for tea when I was there for an interview. He had qualified as a pharmacist, and then he had done theology. He was a very kindly guy, mm -hmm. mature. And I remember being really intimidated at the, at the meal because in the back of my mind, I kept thinking, well, I, it makes perfect sense that this guy worked with Derek, but I don't know where I fit into this program, quite honestly. And um, so that came about, actually, as a result of uh, one of my best friends seeing uh, notices on the board. The, it's old, old school days. We had a big bulletin board in the hall, and you had all kinds of things up there, including jobs or opportunities. And one of my friends came to me and said, I think your job is up on that board. And uh, I went and I looked, and I didn't see anything at all, except there was a letter from Derek Prime to the principal saying that his assistant, the fellow who I just mentioned just now, was going to take a church in Ayrshire, and was there anybody that Gilbert Kirby would recommend that he would see? And um, my friend's then-to-be wife was the principal's secretary. And he said to her, tell Gilbert to, or ask Gilbert if Alistair wouldn't be a good person to meet Derek Prime. And that's what happened. And then he asked me to meet him in the King's Cross railway station in a coffee bar. And um, I remember it was this, one of the scariest mornings I ever spent. <laughs> and the longer it went on and the more I needed to use the bathroom. And, but I, it was one of those situations where I didn't feel comfortable to say, excuse me, could I go to the toilet? You know, because I was in awe of him. <laughs> and I remember he went on, and he asked questions, and then he said, shall we pray? And as soon as he said, amen, you know, I was gone. I was like, <laughs> bam, you know. And uh, I, I never, ever talked to him about that. I think he probably figured it out. But it was a very, it was a very, um, I mean, I, I had long hair. I had a horrible brown suit. Um, I think I still had platform-sold shoes, and I was the most unlikely person that Derek would take on. Hmm. And he did take a big risk on me. But what else is new? You took a big risk on me too, you know, <laughs> a few years later. Yeah. As, as you think about those first years, whether it's at uh, Charlotte or Hamilton, um, you know, ministry for the first time, working through things, resolving foundations, just figuring out life as a married couple, children enter the picture, all of that. What do you, what do you remember about those first years? If you look back and you go, oh my goodness, that was, that was wild. Sue, you got a microphone there. Tell them what you remember. Make it, <laughs> make it good. God, God. Make it good though. Remember something good. <laughs> Close to you. Well, I was 20. Yeah. when uh, we got married. And I was really thrown right into being an, the, the wife of an assistant. And um, really, Edinburgh was um, a fun, a, a beautiful place to, to live. And, um, but I, I wasn't, I lost my grandparents when they were in their 60s, mm. both sets. So I wasn't really used to being with a lot of older people. And uh, while it was a real blend of ages, I just um, didn't feel good in my own skin. And uh, I would go up to Allie after church. Um, we'd be standing out in the courtyard, and I'd say, can I have the keys to the car? <laughs> and he'd say, no, you stand and talk. <laughs> and. Really, not much has changed. <laughs> I'm scared. I'm scared. Um, See, my, my dad used to say that to me, and I just got my own car. Yeah. And yeah. then, then I yeah. go, yeah. Yeah, well. And then Hamilton, of course, they asked you to do stuff. Hamilton, yeah. I, I um, had to do the women's auxiliary, and that 
I was in the bathroom all day Tuesday, was it? Yeah. And um, then juggling three children and trying to yeah. just, you know, be that pastor's wife that would um, stand up and do public prayer and lead. Yeah. I mean, one night we had a woman just fainted on me. And what do you do? Do you just stand there and say, let's say a prayer or, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or call 911? I mean, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that was... Um, I think that was after she had the sandwiches. <laughs> a few, ner few, few nerve-wracking things. Yeah, there's, um, there's no instruction book for that. But um, those were really sweet years. It's a funny thing. When you go back into those settings, names and faces just come flooding back. And there were, I don't know, 600, 700 people mm -hmm. that you knew, you know. And mm -hmm. um, so that was, that was precious. And of course it was precious because we raised our family there and yeah. um, just lots, lots of happy memories. Good. Yeah. When, when you, you're, you're at Hamilton for six years at that point and you start to think through and process what's next, what, what made you come to then the chapel in the first place? If, it, if we're thinking now about 1983. Oh, you mean when we, when we actually finally came? When we, yeah, how long because, was that? Well, the first time we came was, I uh, think, in, in, at the end of 81. And, um, well, we came because it was such a bizarre thing that a man literally showed up at the front door of our house uh, without any prior knowledge or any awareness of who the world he was. I was in my hot rollers. <laughs> And um, I was overdue. I thought you were going to say you were in your hot suit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was overdue with Michelle. Okay. So I was just really excited about going to church, you know. <laughs> so that many, uh, people, many people don't know that the man, I was already, I had already gone to church for the morning service, and, and I always hid in the bathroom. Uh, got a thing about bathrooms, as you can tell. But I, was, I would hide in the bathroom so that I didn't talk to anybody. Um, not because I don't like talking, but I don't want to hear stuff I'm trying to focus. Right. So the last five or six minutes I was in there on this particular Sunday, some came, somebody came knocking on the door in the bathroom, and it was <laughs> Sue, and she said, Ali, come out, come out. And there was a little, it was a beautiful little area where we had our pay phone, which was the only phone that was in the church. When I was a pastor, if I wanted to make a telephone call, I had to put money in the pay phone and phone out. And, uh, so it was it was a it was a high it was a high end operation. But she she said there's a man. She started to say there's a man. He came to the house. He had a taxi. He's from America. I said wait a minute. What do you? And and she said he's in your vestry. And I went in the vestry and sure enough there's a guy, and he says uh, uh, my name is Paul Greeno. I'm from Cleveland, Ohio. I was on a business trip with Luber's Old Corporation. Your name has been given to us. We're looking for a pastor. And I would like to know if you have any interest in, uh, in the possibility of moving. And I, I used to be even more curt than I am now, and I, which is hard to imagine, I know. But I said to him, I said, sir, the service starts in three minutes. The only thing I've got an interest in right now is the service. But I respect the fact that you came, and uh, it's very nice. And he said, well, let me ask you a second question. Are you open to the will of God in your life? Hmm. So I said, well, yeah, yeah, I'd have to answer yes to that. <laughs> and um, and that, was, that was the kickoff of it. I mean, it goes on forever. We don't want to go down all that road. But yeah. it, so how did we end up coming? It, it was really quite bizarre. We traced it back to... MacArthur having been up in Sandusky at that thing called, was it called the Layman's Conference, or what was it called? Layman's Conference? Uh, Ted Blake and some of these older worthy guys ran that. And I guess John had been there, and someone had said at that, maybe it was Wally Pepin or somebody like that, and said, we're looking for a pastor. And John said, well, I have a name for you, but you have to go a long way to find this fellow. And I always say to people that he gave them my name as a joke and that they never got the joke. And um, the joke's been on you ever since. So. <laughs> but that's, I mean, it was, yeah, that's how it started off. Good. 
when you, when you get here and you, you move into a home and you start to get settled, uh, how long did it take before the two of you could, at the end of a Sunday, go, I think, I think we're going to make it. I think it's, I think it's going to be all right. Do you want to try that? <laughs> Microphone. <laughs> well, I would say I went through um, reverse culture shock. Oh, yeah? I grew up in the States. I, I lived in the States until I was 12. Moved to England. Um, lived there four and a half years. Moved back to the States for a few got married, went back to Edinburgh, lived there for eight. And um, so really, in those last eight years, I had just really um, absorbed the culture, Mm -hmm. used words that you had to use to make yourself understood, like, um, I'm going to hoover the room instead of vacuum. And, you know, just, um, I just, uh, I loved, I loved the culture and everything. And... I came back, and I remember standing in, I think it was, was there a Cressy's or a, yeah, anyway, in Bainbridge, standing at the end of the pet aisle and going, what is all this dog food and cat food, you know, <laughs> I mean, who, who needs all this? And it was um, just, everything was bigger and just a bit of a shock initially, yeah. um, but um, yeah, God is good. By Sunday night, though, when was the first Sunday night when you said, we're going st- to, this looks like it works? I, well, last Sunday, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or maybe two weeks ago, I don't know. Yeah. Not this Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now tonight is a different Sunday. <laughs> Show us another video, John. <laughs> I will tell you, though, I will yeah. tell you, in all honesty, when we arrived here on that, on that uh, day, uh, the 3rd of August in 83, you talk about feeling comfortable. I, I don't ever remember feeling as uncomfortable in, in all my life. Um, it was such a jangle of emotions, such a sense of, on the one hand, expectation and fear combined with uh, uh, just such uncertainty about what was really involved. And um, we were all picked up from the airport. And I remember saying to Sue, I hope there's nobody there to pick us up. I hope there's just like one person. And uh, of course, we get there, and there's, there's people with, uh, was, which was very nice. I don't want to be unkind. I mean, it, it, the motivation was good. But once you've flown across the Atlantic, we got in Boston, we got out of Boston. Cameron was four. He drank. He, he couldn't believe flying because he got ginger ale every time he said, can I have ginger ale? And just as the plane was descending into Hopkins, he decides to release all the ginger ale. <laughs> and and, and I, I, remember, I remember he had little khaki pants on, and I'm just looking at him in the seat and said, this is perfect, you know. <laughs> And, and, and then as we walk up the aisle, I'm dreading, oh, no, there, there better not be people there. And we walk out, and Doris Karecki's there. Ginny Griffin is there. They were the secretaries. <laughs> Balloons, banners, Tim Pepin was <laughs> there. Oh, yeah, it was horrible. <laughs> and, um, and then they took us to a house in Shaker Heights, and I just, I just remember I tried to say, I, tried, I said, well, to Sue at least, I said, well, then let's pray. And, and I said, Father. And then he couldn't And, and then, <laughs> then, I, then I couldn't say anything at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I was completely gone. I was wasted. And um, it, got, it got a bunch of fun from that point on. It was, it, I, I, don't know, I don't know how long it took for, for us, if, as they say, to get your feet under the table. Not because of anything on the side of the church, but just all in terms of just your own emotions and, and, and everything else. But those are days are long in the past now. But you made a two-year commitment. Three-year. A three-year. <laughs> yeah. Lost that year. Yeah. To not go back. Hmm. Just to get cemented. Yeah. 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 So that's why we stayed for the first three years without going back. And um, I think that was very important. I'd seen some of my friends come to North America thinking that this was the promised land. 
and um, finding out that it wasn't, and then going back. And I, I, I knew myself enough to know that if I leave myself openings, there's no saying what could happen. And so I made that as a commitment to everybody who knew, my parent, my mom, my dad, my, at least my stepmother, my father. And, and that, that's, what, that's what kept me going. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's very important to, to, do, to do that in life, I think, to establish parameters and then to hold yourself to the commitments that you make because your emotions ebb and flow, Yeah, at least for me. I think we would know clearly the answer of who kept you through those years, no. but what were the practical things that kept you going? I mean, people see the pastor on Sunday with his Bible and the kids in the hallway, but they don't see the behind the scenes things or uh, all the really important bits that, that keep you going as a family, as a couple, as a, a pastor, all, all of those pieces. Well, you know, in the time that we had visited here, we hadn't met many people, but um, a couple of people had, had reached out uh, to me and uh, uh, one of them was Paul Seagott, mm. and um, Paul sort of came alongside, took me under his arm, because I, I didn't understand anything at all. And if there was one thing I would say about the church, I think probably they naively assumed that this transition would be straightforward, and, uh, or, or, or that I would understand things. So, for example, something as simple as tax. Everything is taken out at source in Britain. I never knew anything about it. And someone said, oh, whoa, you've got to pay the tax. And, that, and then when I'd never owned a house, and then we got a bill for real estate tax. I said, what is real estate tax? Where did that come from? Well, fortunately, Paul said, don't worry, don't get alarmed. I'll, I'll look after you here. I'll, I'll help you. And he was representative of others who, who did the same thing and for Sue as well. Um, the, the just genuine signs of of care and affection in, in relationship to the needs of the children as well. That was a huge part of it, I would say. Yeah, my mom and dad were in Detroit and then eventually in Florida. And so, you know, they adopt aunties and uncles, um, a dear couple that would have us to their home every Christmas because mm -hmm. we didn't have any other family. We were Bill and Linda Armstrong. Yeah. And, um, then, of course, there's everybody knows Miss Debbie, that f first grade school teacher. Everybody that, doesn't, but well, yeah. a lot of people do. Who knows Debbie? Debbie Rhodes. Rhodes. There you yeah. go. Yeah. yeah. And she and I would get very close crafting and then put on these Christmas teas and everything. She's, she was. She's telling them about the fashion show here where Jeff Mills made a guest appearance. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's right. That was another one of those teas. Um, yeah, Jeff was Santa. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting to the good stuff now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but in those early days, there were just those special people that filled in the gaps. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, That's yeah it was kind of weird, though. I mean, that was, a, that was a funny event, though, because that was, we did that with, uh, because we were friendly with, uh, I am still very friendly with Peter de Blasi. Um, and uh, Peter, Peter, I remember walking down the main street in Chagrin way, way back and going into the shop and meeting this little Italian man and thinking, maybe we'll be friends. And, uh, you know, 40 years later, we still are. And so he has, he has dressed me, if you like, for 40 years. And um, his, his, his other store for women, then we put on a fashion show here, which was memorable for a number of reasons. One, the Santa Claus appearance, and also because another uh, Parkside person, Pam Tension, that many of you know, uh, she, she, made, she, she walked straight off the end of the, of, of the runway. She, she walked straight. Yeah, it could have been disastrous. And, but she managed to pull it off. She, I think she turned around and said, hey. Yeah. As, yeah. as Pam does. Yeah. No, we had snow in here as well. It was, it was, right? Yeah. <laughs> it was crazy. <laughs> That's unbelievable. <laughs> in, let's say, your first couple years here, in those first three, 
we, we know we wanted to define success in terms of faithfulness and trust the Lord for the fruit, but if you have gone, if, if we could just accomplish or try to do these couple things, I think that would be a good start. What, what would those things have been? Well, get, yeah, get to know the leaders of the church at a level that is um, beyond simply, my name is Jim or something. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and hopefully allow them to get to know you in a way that won't immediately alarm them or, or disappoint them. Um, you know, we had some, some, fun, some fun meetings in the early days um, that, you know, they, 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 were, they were hilarious at times. I mean, Mike Fox, I remember being there, and he was a funny man. And uh, often humor really helped because uh, I'm not sure that between us all together we really had much of an idea about what we were doing. Um, I remember Jeff and Terry having us in their home, and uh, I think uh, Terry's back was bothering her, and so it seemed just sensible for us all to lie down on the floor. And uh, if anyone ever come in the house, they'd say, what the <laughs> world is going on here? And it didn't help, it was just Beatles music pounding out <laughs> over the stereo. And, uh, and that might be the night we went home and said, I think this place is gonna be okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, getting, getting to, yeah, just, actually, it, it, it didn't work in those first three years, I don't think, what we hoped to do. Um, by the time we went home at the three-year mark, I realized that a lot of the things that I assumed were assumptions that weren't shared assumptions or convictions. There's no judgment in that at all, but I was just, I was assuming that, that we, we all understood certain things together, and I realized that more work had to be done in relationship to that, and and came back with more of a focus. I don't really know how it worked out, but but I knew that that needed to be done. You know, I was pulling the rope, but the bell didn't ring, and that was because the the rope wasn't attached to the bell at that point, and that's been that's been part of the journey. Yeah. You've been on all sorts of trips, whether it's with Kep or with Jeff or together or separately. Uh, as you think back to all the countries and things that you've got to do, any times where you thought we're not going to make it back? Yeah. Uh, every time with Jeff? Yeah, well, yeah. no, 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 I wouldn't. I, no, no. I, I, I would say with Phil Hall. With Phil Hall? Yeah. Are you, or, or Beijing. Or Beijing? Yeah. Okay, well, let me, let me suggest, I think with Phil Hall. Why with Phil Hall? <laughs> because you went into the bush in- Oh yeah, I went into the bush. Yeah. I, I think eight days, <laughs> I never heard from Allie. <laughs> I wasn't in a bush for eight days. The we bush. Were, we, were, we, were, the bush. we went to Liberia and we went to Kenya, 1986. Uh, Phil Hall, Dr. Phil Hall, and, um, and when we got to Liberia, I was invited to go with a, a fellow called Bishop Marway to the Ivory Coast to conduct a funeral. And Phil uh, strategically came down with a little bit of a tummy bug and decided <laughs> that he should stay in Liberia and that I should go with the guy by myself. That was, that was pretty freaky. I remember uh, pulling into a village with no lighting at all, nothing, and the, we went to the place where the body was. It was a chieftain, and they had him laid out there. He'd been there for, for a few days waiting for us. And it was, a, you know, Liberia was a, there, a lot, it was animistic in its culture, and so it had a lot of the stuff that was part and parcel of that. And I remember actually sitting and holding onto the chair as the professional mourners made these unbelievable wailing sounds. Mm. And then they took me to a house, and I remember it didn't have actual windows, it just was open to the animals on the outside. And then they said, and this is your room. And when I got to I realized, this is your room, i.e. the room for you and the bishop. And this is your bed i.e. the bed for me and the bishop. <laughs> and as one of the, I, I, I don't stay awake a lot, but I was awake most of that night. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, that, 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 might have, that might have been 
a little, that might well, be. When, when you got the flat tire on the way, too. Oh, yeah, it yeah. goes on forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, think, I, I think the first trip I made with Kep, from the youngest up or from the up to the youngest, to the jungle, I did not. I, I, mind you, I've never been a fan of Kep James's driving. Um, I don't want to be unkind to him, but he sees things as just suggestions. They're not necessarily, it's like, you could go there if you want, but you could also go over there. That'd be a nice place to go. And some of you have subsequently been, these are, year, these are years ago, when a lot of this road that is a, is, a, is a notorious road in the world, and when you look over the side, you can actually see buses and, um, and large lorries that have gone off the edge and they've gone down there never to return again. But that didn't stop old Kep from just flying ahead, you know. It's four-wheel drive, we're fine, we're fine. And I remember I just was scared, I was scared to death. I thought the chances of us going over here and joining one of these school buses is pretty strong. But, um, and I had reason for that because when I came and Kep was the youth pastor, he could, he could lose an entire youth ministry, you know, taking them on a school trip. Uh, the, parents, the parents would be waiting for them coming back and there's nobody here. And, he's, he's, and he got on the phone and said, yeah, the bus went to uh, somewhere and then we were going to go there, but it went there and, we were, and we'll be back soon, you know. And uh, bless him. That's, that pioneer spirit, though, is why Cap and Debbie are still doing what they're doing right now, because anybody other would not be doing it. Yeah, that deserves a big round of applause for Cap and Debbie. Yeah. All right, this is risky on my part, but I've been told that the video will work this time. So we'll, we'll, give, we'll give Terry a second go. Hello, Alistair. <laughs> See the things I do for you. I mean, what's with Joy sending this email? Please record horizontally. I mean, Kay never had me do anything like this. I feel like the prophet Ezekiel. But anywho, I'm on to wish you um, all the best in your 40 year celebrations for your 40 years of ministry uh, at Parkside. You know, Alistair, there's tons of us over here in Scotland that wish you had never went away to America, that we'd lost you to America. But you know, the truth is, you have done more for the gospel in Scotland over these past 40 years by being in America than you could have ever done uh, by, by staying here. And we at Hope for Glasgow and um, our recipients of that um, as well. Brother, it's, it's a great joy, you know, to be a minister uh, for any length of time, um, as hard as ministry is, is, is a great feat. And to do it in the one place for 40 years without being found out, it's absolutely amazing. And it's, it's a great joy even in these last years, Alistair, to see how, um, you know, ministries have popped up other places where it's sending people out for Parkside uh, to plant churches. Most recently, uh, we Dan Southam at Parkside, Parkside Heights. Um, it's a great joy, brother. And, uh, you know, love to Sue, um, who has been your mainstay uh, all these years, you know, helping keep you in ministry, as I've said before. Um, uh, keep me off the streets and keep me in ministry. So, Sue, on a night like this, uh, we want to honour you um, as well. Um, I hope you have a great time, brother. And, uh, you know, love to the church there. And I hope it won't be too long before I see you face to face. Well, now that I'm down here, it's took me that much effort uh, to get down here. I'm just going to see if there's anything else I can do while I'm here. Hello, Alistair. What a privilege to be able to congratulate you in this way on 40 years of faithful and fruitful gospel ministry at Parkside. Of course, sadly, the commute for us uh, would be a bit long for us to be able to be members at Parkside. But we are so grateful for your, uh, for your fidelity to scripture, for your warmth and excitement about the Lord Jesus and making him known, and for your personal humility and kindness. It's been a privilege to work with you and many congratulations. Uh, many, many thousands of people will have been blessed by four decades of service at Parkside and many millions of people have been blessed by the overflow of that ministry through Truth For Life and the books. It's been a, a great privilege to get to know you a little and to work with you. 
I hope you and Susan have a fantastic day celebrating all of the Lord's kindnesses to you over the last 40 years and all of the ways that the Lord has worked so greatly through you both over those four decades. Have a wonderful day. Alistair and dear brothers and sisters at Parkside, it is my very great pleasure to, however inadequately, express my gratitude to God for the way in which his blessing of you all over these last 40 years has overflowed, as the Lord's blessings are wont to do, to the ends of the earth. You can't get much more ends of the earth than here in Sydney, Australia. And I know I speak for many in this part of the world, because many have told me, in saying thank you for the main things and the plain things, the plain things that are the main things of God's wonderful word that have been brought to us clearly, richly, freshly, warmly, firmly from the pulpit at Parkside. Thank you, dear friends. This long distance fellowship in our Lord Jesus Christ is precious beyond words. My dear Alistair, 40 years at Parkside I hear what a splendid record. Even longer than my 37 years at St. Helens. And I thank God I was able to come to those wonderful conferences, and I hope they still go on. I'm still at work in a small way, 898, and creaking a bit. So, my dear friend, all good wishes to you both, and to all the good people at Parkside, Please keep going. Is 98? Yeah. It's truly amazing. We tried to put Terry on the whole board. I think that's what broke it in the first place. Yeah. 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 I just just want to ask you a a couple more questions and then we'll we'll bring things to a close, at least in terms of my part. Uh, I asked you a little bit about those first days at Parkside, the rawness and the newness of of everything. Um, What do you miss about uh, the the feel of uh, new life, figuring things out? Um, Everything's unknown in some ways, exciting, um, daunting. Uh, Are there particular things that, that you miss about that era that you go, oh, if I could get that back, I'd love to? Well, this morning, Alistair, as he often does on a Sunday morning, left me a love note. Hmm. And I probably can't even tell you what it said. But he we'll quoted okay. <laughs> he, he quoted a James Taylor song. Hmm. And this is where I need Allie to tell me the lyrics of the songs. I have melodies going on in my head all the time. And I tell him, Ali, I need to sit next to you in heaven so that you can tell me all the words to the songs. <laughs> mm. But I'll let you, um, you want me give, to... give the gist of that song. Oh. If we could do it all again. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Did you but forget? Th- was that a question? Yeah. It was? I think so. Okay. Um, what do you miss uh, about those days? Anyway, it's a good, yeah, I, I can tell him that song. It, look for this song. It's by James Taylor. Yo-Yo Ma plays the cello part on it. Mm. Taylor wrote it for his wife. It starts, you and I again. The days go by, and I wish that I could have the whole thing back again so that we could be kinder to one another and so on. It's a, it's, a one, it's a wonderful song, and the cello part in it is, is fantastic. And so, yes, I did write that to you this morning, but I, I don't know those lyrics well enough, well enough to um, repeat them, and of course, nobody wants me to sing them. So, um, <clears throat> I, you know, I would say something, John, in answer to that as well, that I don't, I, I actually, I don't, I don't miss much. I don't miss much. I mean, when I left the, um, the church in Scotland, at the farewell to me there, the, one of the main deacons, big guy called uh, Naismith, he said, Alistair came to us as a young man in a hurry, 
and he leaves us as a young man in a hurry. And, um, and I don't think that was a compliment on his part. But the fact is that I am in a bit of a hurry. And one of the reasons that I think things have worked for us here, one of the reasons, is that there's not a lot that's routine. The, the, the commitment that we have to doing the basics well most of the time, that, is, that, is, that just goes on and on. But, I mean, if you think about it in terms of the first three years we were here, and then we sold the building, then we go to a high school that we're going to be in for maybe two years. We end up seven and a half years in that high school. Then we move into here in 1993. And the, the, the thing is in, constant, is in a wonderful constant state of flux that, that really appeals to me, because I like change. And uh, the change in the development of the planting of you know, seeing these young guys like McAlvey, who came, a round-faced fellow from Detroit, and uh, to meet a couple this morning from the West Side who were here for some reason, and to realize, you know, how God is prospering that, and we can go right down the line. And if, um, if all things go to plan, you're going to go down that line as well, and that will be your next stop. And the, the, that, so that sense of movement, that sense of progress, that sense of looking forward, is I look back with gratitude. In certain cases, I look back with regret. There are certain things you would like to do differently and should probably have done differently. But by and large, I'm, 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 looking, I'm looking forward rather than looking back. Good. Well, I think we have uh, one last video, and then uh, my piece is done. Thanks for your patience. He won't say this, but the reason that he's asking the questions is because this marks 40 years in a very very obvious way, in that 40, 40 years ago I did his baby dedication, and I, and I, held, I held him in my arms up here, uh, where, or over there at, 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 the, at the previous building. And uh, there's a sense in which the trajectory and the longing of uh, the leadership's hearts for the developing of young men in ministry is, uh, is illustrated in a wonderful way sitting here. Mm. I'm very happy to be given the privilege of wishing my dear friend Alistair Begg a happy 40th anniversary as pastor of Parkside. Where did all the decades go? I can think back to the first meeting I had with Alistair over in Scotland. He was pastor of Hamilton Baptist Church, and I had the opportunity to preach there and to travel around Scotland with him and, um, and do some ministry together. Obviously, the Lord built a bond and a friendship there, and uh, the Lord had a plan beginning to unfold then. I remember when I, I left Scotland, and Alistair and I talked about the fact that maybe someday the Lord would bring him to the United States, and the Lord did just that, and he came, and the, the next 40 years is history. Pretty remarkable, really, that he came and stayed in one church for four decades. Uh, I understand that. I'm headed toward 55 years of pastoral ministry at Grace Community Church. And I know what a blessing it is to me to have a congregation to pour my life into for half a century. And I, I thank the Lord that Alistair has had the same experience. And you that have benefited by his ministry and will continue to do so, I know you even more than I can say understand the gift of God that Alistair is to your life and your congregation. Uh, we pray God's continued blessing on Alistair and Sue and their family and on Parkside Church. God bless you. You can you cannot leave just yet. Um, I'd like to thank you, John. Great job pivoting. Yeah. <laughs> it was really good. Yeah. yeah. Despite what I said, right? I'd like to invite the elders and pastors to join us on the platform to pray for Alistair and Sue right now.
Let us pray. Our gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we've gathered together this evening to praise and to thank you for the four decades of ministry that Alistair and Susan have given to Parkside. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for showing them your grace, your steadfast love, and your faithfulness. And we're grateful this evening for their commitment to you, their faithfulness to each other, and for their faithful stewardship to us as a congregation. Father, as they anticipate what lies before them, we pray that you would fill them with the knowledge of your will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord Jesus. Help them, Heavenly Father, to fully please you. May they bear fruit in every good work. And Father, may they continue to run the race that's before them. Strengthen them as they face life's inevitable challenges, and may they look only to the Lord Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Heavenly Father, we come with humble and thankful hearts uh, this evening. Our hearts overflow with gratitude as we think back on the 40 years of Alistair and Susan's ministry here at Parkside Church. We thank you for your faithfulness in our lives and in their lives. And when we reflect back on when they came, we think of the great gift that both of them have been to us. We think of how Alistair has been committed to teaching us his, the, the word. We thank you for Alistair's commitment uh, to integrity. We thank you for Susan's ministry of loving Alistair, her family, and friends. Uh, years ago, Alistair completed uh, the study of Joseph, and he summarized three points. The first was, we're all mortal, and we're going to die. You either die in Christ or out of Christ. Secondly, we all have an authority in our life that we live by. We will live with the authority of the Bible. And thirdly, we will all leave a legacy. Lord, we're thankful that by your grace and mercy, Alistair and Susan have lived for your glory, have been your servants, have been your ambassadors. And we pray that for the remaining days that you'll assist them to complete this legacy. And we ask, Lord, that this would be done for your glory and for their good. And we also pray that as a congregation, we have the immense privilege of praying for their well-being, for their protection, and for their usefulness. We thank you, Lord, for being our Lord, for loving us and caring for us, and being so faithful over these 40 years. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And Father God, as we reflect on these moments tonight, in these words, we're thankful for the way that uh, you have worked in Alistair's life since he was a child, for the provision of godly parents who uh, shared your word and shared the gospel with him, for teachers and leaders and Sunday school workers who have implanted your word in his heart, and for the preparation he received uh, before he came here, for the experiences of teaching your word and caring for a congregation. And though he came here uncertain and with many cares, as he's explained tonight, we know that you were with him, that your Holy Spirit was guiding, and you had built convictions into his heart that he has shared with us now for 40 years. We're thankful for your protection over he and Susan and their family for the provision of children and grandchildren, and for the sustaining of their health, and the protection from the attacks of the evil one. And so now, tonight, as we give thanks for all these things, we continue to lift them before your throne. We pray that you would continue to give them years of service and years of commitment to each other, and most of all to Christ. And it's to him that we give all the thanks for all of this. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Amen.
Okay, we have uh, a few gifts that we'd love to present on behalf of the congregation. So the, the first gift Looks like Sue. is a, a beautiful wrapped box, but it's representative <laughs> of three other boxes, the same size, full of notes mm. of encouragement, remembrances, and thankfulness uh, to both of you uh, for these last 40 years. Mm. So I hope you'll have Thank you very some much joy, indeed. fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And <laughs> I just would like to read uh, the second gift so that we can all hear. Dear Alistair and Susan, an appreciation for your 40 years of faithful service to Parkside Church. The elders on behalf of the entire congregation are gifting you with a trip to Tuscany. We pray this trip to one of your favorite places will be one of special refreshment and, and will provide many fun and happy memories and also be a reminder of how much Jesus loves you and we love you as a church family. We thank God for you and pray God's best for you in the days ahead as we know the best is yet to come in Christ. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much. Can I say something? You uh, actually, guys, you can. Well, I thought it was a male voice choir now. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, Alistair, if you would like to say something, we'd, we'd love to. Yeah, I'd just like to say to one thing, if I could. Sure. Um, because uh, what, what I want to say is a huge thank you on behalf of Sue and myself and uh, our children, too. Um, they are the beneficiaries of your affection, your care, your provision for them in more ways than you will ever know. And um, the, the, the wonderful thing that God has chosen to do here, he has done um, on account of all the gifts that he's given to all, the, all of us together, and that all of it, none of us are that good on our own, <clears throat> and that we're all, we're all better in the company of one another, and that's why God um, does the church. But I decided I want to go upstairs and see what it was I said on the first Sunday that I, that I preached. In, and and this, is, uh, this is the 11th of, uh, um, it's not actually, it's, yeah, it was the 11th of September, 1983. And I, I'm going to redo the entire sermon. No, it's uh, <clears throat> uh, 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 for a long time now, my heart and mind has been toward this day. As it has drawn closer, I've been increasingly exercised as to what should be our starting point. I've taken note of what others have said, and, and uh, I'm not going to do what any of them said. <laughs> I, I, on the first Sunday that we were here, I visited a church in the area, and in anticipating the day, I asked the Lord perhaps for a word of direction. Imagine my consternation when I discovered that the subject for that morning was flee to the hills. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I said on that morning, as you can tell from my presence, I didn't take it too much to heart. And more and more in recent weeks, I found myself um, turning to the book of Nehemiah. And then I said, so why would we begin here? Well, because it's the, the way in which uh, we discover how a work of God takes place. And, and I said, the chapters that we study will allow us to do four things. One, to determine our priorities, um, to discover biblical principles, to make sure that it is the Scripture that dictates our posture, the posture being, first of all, the posture of our hearts, walking in the fear of the Lord. And uh, the fourth one was, uh, because the Word of God will direct our progress. Where are we going? On the path of faith and obedience. With God's help, we're going forward. We must be careful not to be like the church who passed the following fourfold resolution. I, I can't remember what it was. It was something silly like, uh, we will build a new church. Um, we will build a new church on the site of the old church. We will use the material 
in the old church in the construction of the new church. And we will continue using the old church until the new church is ready. <laughs> so, yeah, so it doesn't work. Anyway, uh, yeah, so that, yeah, it was, it was pretty bad. It was, yeah. Um, we need a heart like Nehemiah's that cares to ask the right questions. We need a concern like Nehemiah's that weeps at the condition in which he finds himself. We need a commitment like Nehemiah's, who is a classic example of someone who put his hand to the plow and refused to look back. Let's be careful then how we build and go out into this week aware of the fact that we encounter broken up people with broken down lives. Father, help us with our priorities and give us a heart that trembles at the approach of sin. That was, that was how we started. And we haven't really moved on, have we? I mean, it's, it, we just keep saying the same thing over and over again, because the main things really are the plain things, and the plain things are the main things. Um, thank you for this evening. Thank you for these things. Thank you for the privilege of uh, putting up with us quite well, putting up with me for sure for all this time. Um, it, it, I think, you know, it, John was very kind in his questions um, because he should have pressed on, or he could have pressed on the fact that after a period of time here, this wasn't really going anywhere fast. And uh, that was when I would sit with uh, uh, Phil Hall and, uh, and Bill Newton and talk about the future of the church. And I said to them that, um, you know, I thought that I, about seven years or eight years into, I thought I pretty well shot my wad. That, um, I, you know, I didn't know how to organize a team. I didn't know how to do a bunch of stuff. I, it hadn't been my background. It wasn't in my training. And I said, you know, I think the fact is that I'm just, I'm incompetent. And Bill Newton classically said, I don't think you're incompetent. I think you're lazy. <laughs> and um, and, so, and so, I, I said, well, thank you for the encouragement. I said, well, um, I, um, so now I, I, what I'm going to have to do is prove my incompetence. And I did that successfully. And that then led to the question, okay, how do you want to fa figure this? Do you want to continue with the level of incompetence that I have? Shall I go somewhere else now, and I've maybe got a seven-year window of usefulness before everybody figures me out and realizes, you know, we're pretty well done? Um, or shall we consider the possibility of staffing my incompetence? And they said, well, we don't want to lose you, so let's go with a third option. And that, of course, then brings us to Jeff Mills. And uh, without Jeff, I am not standing here tonight. And Sue, Sue knows that. So. It's true. Yeah. So credit where credit's due. And actually, Bill Newton really was right because I was thinking about it just the other day, and I said, you know what? That's right. It wasn't an either-or. I am lazy and incompetent. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so I'm going to go home and go to bed, <laughs> but only after, only after our, favorite, our favorite man does whatever needs to be done. I'm sorry for intruding on the proceedings. Thank you. I think we have one song left. Oh, good. And then a uh, brief prayer and benediction, and then we'll be able to go home for the night. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you. Well, let's, let's stand and we'll sing together. You have been faithful to a thousand generations, slow to anger, swift.
Almighty God, again, we come to you and just say thank you. You have been so good to us. And we have confidence that you will continue to be good because you never change. You are not like the shifting shadows. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness in giving to us a pastor who loves us through the preaching of your word, through not being ashamed of the gospel. And I pray that we would take that good news out into the world as we face tomorrow. And so we say, now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with every good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Go in peace.